Hello, everybody. Um, I don't often stick my head above the parapet. It's not really my thing. But I did just want to take a moment to explain our show this week. Wales against England, hey? A mad, passionate, controversial, colourful, thrilling, extraordinary, maddening and quite wonderful game of rugby. It had everything that we love about sport and a whole lot more and ended up in a well-deserved and a glorious win for Wales. I reckon, and what do you think? 10 million people will have watched it? Probably about that. And then, of course, as we all know, a small toxic minority went to work. In the aftermath, we've had the BBC reporter Sonia McLaughlin reduced to tears. We've had our very own Ellis Genge receiving death threats for not clapping at the point a cameraman passed him. We've had the former England captain Will Carling staggered at the amount of abuse directed at the current England captain Owen Farrell. We've had referee Pascal Gauzer trolled and ridiculed to the point of humiliation. And we've had the RFU and the WRU pleading for calm and respect. Rugby often gives out about its higher morals and frankly in these circumstances that feels a little bit embarrassing. There isn't a single person who offered a 140 character opinion on any of the above who could have done any better on Saturday. Not one. Because if they could have done better they would have been out there in the heat of the moment. And there's every chance that if they were out there in the heat of the moment for long enough that they might have the odd off day too. What do you reckon? Isn't that the way life works? It's a game of rugby, and the vast majority of you will know and recognise that. It is played by staggeringly committed, talented players who sacrifice astonishing amounts to represent their country. Yes, they're well paid, and yes, they deserve to be. Wales could not buy a win last year, and they have recovered superbly to win the Triple Crown. England won everything there was to win last year, and they're currently suffering a bit of a dip. That is the essence of of sport. That is why we tune in. That's why we buy tickets. It's why we scream, we shout, we sing and we cheer. And that is what keeps us coming back because it would be a little bit dull if the storyline never changed. We were obviously going to offer a view. We were going to offer our 2P and we were going to debrief on an extraordinary game. And we'd have probably occupied the middle ground, which is where we try quite hard to sit. And we'd have probably netted out roughly with what I've just said. But frankly, it feels like enough has been written and said already. And I reckon 9.9 .9 million of you would probably agree. So this week, we're going to talk to and celebrate one of the greatest that there's ever been. Probably the biggest name we've ever had on the show before. Hask is so excited he's gotten to bed, um, which is a little disturbing. I know that Dan's a little put off already. But ladies and gents, boys and girls, roll up, roll up, please. Welcome to Mr. Dan Keller. How are you? Jeez, that's uh, that was a beautiful Kiwi accent there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Don't, it's worked, he's worked, worked on it all day. You don't don't yeah, go. Um, you've come from a business meeting. What have you been doing? Oh, jeez. Um, yeah, retirement life. That's uh, that's not too bad. No, it was actually just something for uh, AstraZeneca. Actually, they are doing the UK rollout of the yeah the vaccine over there. Just kind of I stumbled across um, doing a whole lot of sort of leadership and talking about culture and winning and I guess a whole lot of learnings that I've learned over the last 18 years or so being a professional sportsman and applying it in, in ways with different businesses. It's, um, yeah, I don't know. I never thought I'd be doing it, but it's, it's so, quite exciting. It's, it's, You're not uh, saying you range of wigs, are you, with a haircut? <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that special hair piece you uh, I knew Harry. it actually. Harry. I, I, I jumped on and I was like, okay, it doesn't really matter how my hair is, you know, because I've actually got some. And oh, some nice, nice. Well I played. always knew that I was going to be safe. But the fact you brought the hair up straight away, Hess, who's, you know, he's clutching to keep his on and, and turns, we don't even need to go there. He's, yeah, it's gone long ago. So um, if you want Brace to chat it. about here, Payno and I can take this offline and um, <laughs> we'll, we'll compare quaff notes yeah, in the aftermath. Nice. I'm looking forward to it. I love that. Two World Cups, more silverware. I mean, it's nice of you to display the silverware behind yeah. you as well. We've got the Southbridge under 10s, 11s, 12s, 13s, 14s, <laughs> 15s, 16s and 17s. Mind you. But now you're clearing up COVID as well. I mean, is this the new, you know, is this the new life? going into into big biz i'm still trying to work that out at the moment the the scary thing is and these boys have been through it you know that fear of what is next um post playing because i've had a vision um for the last 18 years you know always wanted to be an all black i achieved that in 2003 then i got a taste of of test match footy and i just i loved it and i just didn't want that feeling to, to ever stop and and from that day of my first test match my goal or my vision was to to be an all black great, you know, not just another one test match all black, not a 
a player, you know, to play for the All Blacks, has only played 10 test matches. And to do that, you need to play for a, a long time. So that was what was getting me out of bed each day and, and driving me. And, and then all of a sudden, you close the door on that. It's, okay, well, okay, what's my purpose? You know, what what is it that's going to get me out of bed? So I'm, I'm going through that repurposing at the moment. And the more I dive into it, the more I realize how obsessed I was with, with winning and just that sort of winning mentality and, and the art of winning is something I'm sort of focusing a, a little bit uh, on at the moment. Very interesting. I always like seeing your notes before a game where you, you put, you'd like, right, focus, refocus, stay in the moment, and then there'd be a smiley face, have fun, or something that you'd always put at the end of it. Oh, Was that always the key, though? Because for young kids growing up, sometimes you focus on the process and what it is and the big stage but you've got to have fun. You won't play well if you're not enjoying what you're doing. So was that always a big focus for you, even though you clearly went through all those mental processes and how you're going to lead the team, you had to make sure you were enjoying it and you had to remind, the worst thing is you had to remind yourself that you had to, <laughs> you had to enjoy it. Yeah, as your career gets on, it's, it's something you have to remind yourself of more, you know, the reason that you are playing. And and to be honest, I was fortunate enough to, to drag it out as long as I did, but I had to sort of keep reminding myself why I'm doing it. And, it always came down for the enjoyment. You know, I just took myself back to when I was a little six-year-old um, playing for the first time and just running around with your mates and and that sort of sense of satisfaction. You know, that's what I wanted all through my career. And, and to be honest, I did have it um, all through my career and, and just having little constant reminders, as tough as it's going to get out there, just something as simple as a smile. When you look at thinking of your notes, it's like, okay, cool, man, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to be out here doing what I love. So, that you know, that constant reminder was was important to me and you know I'm a pretty simple fella so you know when when you are sort of I did share those notes I'd like to think a lot of people would see that and say look there's no magic and ingredient it's just uh, all about being simple and and you know doing things that uh, you know they're going to make a difference to me. Interesting I don't know if you know we had um, Ma Nonu on the other day we had a very good chat with him we had Kieran Reid on as well which was lovely and it's always really helpful we, we always ask people to pop over a CV um, you know, this show is all about the detail. So they, they obviously sent through their, their resumes and that kind of thing. We asked, obviously, the same of you. So thank you for sending that through. Um, I'm going to be honest, as, as it goes, I don't know whether you can see it, but a CV that just says Dan Carter, goat, I think it's possibly <laughs> kind of... Um, I mean, it's not up for debate, I suppose, but it's worth asking you at this point, and it's a flippant question, but how good were you? I, I get a little bit... You know, when, when people throw out that GOAT term, terminology, you know, because for me, there are, you know, players out there that uh, are much better players and have better careers than I did. Um, the thing is the greatest of all time, the GOAT, you know, you can only have one, but I think it's thrown around far too too much. Oh, he's a GOAT, or he's a GOAT, he's a GOAT. They're all in the same sport. It's like, hold on, you can only choose one. So for me, to, to be called it, you know, obviously, you know, pretty humbled by that, but in my opinion... I wasn't. There were better players out there that that did so much more for the game. You're right, Jonah Lomer. You're right. You, you're just yeah. a close second. Yeah. But who, <laughs> who, who? When you when you say there are other players who've done a lot more, um, you know, looking objectively, I'm 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 struggling. I mean, there are, there are there are equals, but I wouldn't say there are many who've done more. Who would you look at in that instance? No, with Tins, I would have said um, Jonah, and obviously he, he changed the game. He turned the game into a global game. He's a big part of the reason that the game went professional. So. Um, in my eyes, he was someone that I always looked up to and, and thought was the GOAT. Um, but then playing alongside Richie McCaw and, and just seeing the the way he went about his preparation, his leadership, the way he was able to put his body on the line, the way he wasn't even able to feel pain, um, or if he did, he was amazing at hiding it. And just basically similar to uh, Michael Jordan, the last dance, he, he was the Michael Jordan where he would just bring the team with him, you know? often refer to him as Batman and I was always just Robin. So I just kind of like support him like, the whole way. He's like, right, we're going here, we're doing this. And he'd sacrificed so much. I'm like, man, that's, uh, that's incredible. I'm just going to jump on your sort of bandwagon. And, you know, if you need me for anything, then uh, I'll do it. And actually we formed, you know, quite a good relationship um, purely because of his mindset and he, he knew where he wanted to, to take his game and the team. So and in my eyes, you know, he, he's the GOAT. Did you, if you're not going to be, let yourself become the GOAT, and we set up a group of rugby Avengers that were all like <laughs> yes. equal because you know, they got equal power. Like so, so like you're like Tony Stark, the good-looking Iron Man one. You know, maybe like Richie would be, I don't know, I don't know who we put there. Jonah's the Hulk. America. 
Yeah, Captain America. Yes, that's, that's very right. Good so, would call, you would you let us put us in the Rugby Avengers gang? Would you accept that oh, membership? Oh, I'd, I'd love that. Yeah, okay, well and fine. truly. I'm trying to work out. My mind just goes straight to what superhero you boys are. Uh, I'm not in the group. I'm not even yeah, in the, we're in the group. I don't think <laughs> we haven't made the team. There's the Joker. <laughs> we're in Eddie Jones's shadow squad to the Avengers. Yeah. We haven't quite if, there's made can, if there's a canteen for the Avengers, I'm serving the mashed potato to the lads <laughs> with like a cigarette out of a hat on. That's, that's, they, they keep me there because I'm like, humorous but i'm not involved in the main team like if everybody died they might call me up but there's they... avengers night out they might call the social secretary <laughs> yeah. but he stays in his office he's not allowed oh, out we have room for everyone yeah i think we need to look far wider than just superheroes and everything that superheroes need you know like food canteen you're working on that entertainment dad on a serious question though because I, I we've asked this to a few people who are retired and i was vocal about it in a completely different way because i was nothing even one percent of what you were like as a player and i know you're very humble but do you now in these moments of retirement even if you don't accept yourself to be the best do you appreciate though and did you enjoy what you were doing you know do you look back with a fond memories or because a lot of times when you're in it people are always pursuing being better do you actually look back and reflect and go do you know what <laughs> i did actually have some real good moments and i did enjoy it yeah, yeah, I have to be honest. And to be honest, I've probably almost been retired for 12 to 24 months now. I've slowly been, been winding down. So I just, you know, made it official and, you know, made it very clear that I was retiring from professional rugby. Doesn't mean I've finished playing the odd, uh, you know, fun game here or there. Um, but through this, this last sort of two years, I had a neck injury that kept me up for 10 months, all through COVID, where I, you know, I was forced back to New Zealand and couldn't finish my contract in Japan you know so I've had time it just hasn't finished suddenly so but through that time you know when I've been reflecting when I've been working if I still have the drive to continue to play it does it, it takes you back to you know some of the the milestones in your career and some of the things that I've achieved and you did right like when you're in the moment you just worrying about what's next okay cool you know I'm in Japan might be my last year in Japan I'm gonna do whatever it takes to to help the team, you know, win this uh, this championship, you know. So that's where your focus is. You're not sitting back, oh, that was amazing. We did it last year. Oh, actually, a couple of years ago, we won the French, you know. You you just don't have time to, to reminisce and think about it. But now through this process that I've been through, and even now, there are a few moments where I'm like, okay, that, that was pretty cool. Being able to, to be a part of, you know, teams that have you know won back-to-back -back world cups that was a, a huge sort of milestone being able to bounce back from some pretty devastating injuries uh, to be able to go to to new countries new cultures and be successful there um, so yeah well and truly I've, I've had a bit of time to reflect and you know it's, it's pretty proud uh, sort of proud to think of, of you know, the things that I had been able to achieve. When you look at those moments, now, I remember interviewing a Driscoll years ago in his pomp, and he said there were times as a player where it almost sort of seemed to slow down a little bit. And I don't know whether he was cracking the matrix, but he sort of said that he was able to see what was going to happen long before it happened. When you look back at the greatest moments of your career, can you remember what those moments were like where you had everything as you wanted it, when you wanted it? Yeah, and my mind goes straight to the... Um, 2015 Rugby World Cup final, where I just felt like I was in the zone. Um, obviously, nothing's guaranteed in sport in terms of the result. You know, just because you're finishing or your good teammates, seven of us were finishing, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to have su success. So, but for that sort of 80 minutes or however long that the game went for, uh, you know, because there are a few stoppages and whatnot, but it, it was. I just felt like in, in complete control, and it was quite the contrast to when I was playing when I was younger. I was just playing with, with confidence, just playing on instincts, probably a little bit greedy at times because you just back to yourself. Um, you just, you know, carry the ball when you want. You wouldn't worry about the overlap that you had um, outside you. But as you <coughs> evolved, I want to talk about it without sounding a little bit too matrixy and, uh, you know, but <laughs> at, at the same time, I just felt in, in complete control. It, you know, it felt like the previous three World Cups that I'd had. Um, yes, we won 2011, but, you know, I had some pretty big disappointment around that with being injured and, and not feeling part of that success. So all those moments and pretty much everything in my career just felt like it was catered for me to control the last game that I was going to have in, in the black jersey. And and through that that game, it's exactly how I felt, just in com complete control, you know, the momentum shift. And I was the person to be able to, to change the momentum. 
you know, I grew up just respecting and admiring um, Johnny Wilkinson and just the way he used to be able to control a game. And then for him to have a moment like he did in 2003 to win the World Cup with a drop goal, in my mind, I always wanted that moment. But the more work that I I did with uh, head coaches, psychologists, the more that I was chasing an unrealistic dream. And I learned to get just as much satisfaction out of being able to to change momentum in a game or being able to be really clear in the moment and and walk towards pressure and and things like that. So, you know, I I didn't get that sort of magical moment in in the World Cup final, but I felt like I was part of, you know, the changing of momentum, which is actually something I focused more on the back end end of my career rather than those sort of dream magical moments that, um, you know, very rarely happen. So, just that satisfaction of everything that happened in that game. It just felt like a, a full international career of highs and lows were all catered, you know, for that one moment. Even your psychologist saw the rest of your team sheet and he was like, mate, there's no chance you're going to be needing a drop goal to win an extra time. <laughs> you're going to be walking <laughs> it anyway. An interesting thing you said to me in 2019 was when you were sort of in Japan, you had your neck injury. And I was like, why are you still playing? What? And you were like, I like the story. I want to make it. I want to make a comeback. And I was like... You don't need another addition to your story. Stop being greedy and just get on and retire. You can't steal every single story. Have a, It's unbelievable. Was that actually a driver for you to come back and prove you could still either play even if it was in, in Japan or come back? Because that is what you wanted to do, wasn't it? It was a driver for you. I was actually pretty taken back by that injury because, you know, the, the seriousness, seriousness of the injury... Um, a lot of people telling you, you, you got to finish, you got to finish. So, you know, after the World Cup, I, I went to Europe with uh, racing with a sole focus of trying to win a, a European championship. Now, we didn't do that. I got in the final twice. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's just dwell on that, shall we? Seems, com- seems comfortable on your tongue dwelling yeah. on that. <laughs> there was an opportunity to go back to, to racing. Obviously, signed the contract, was had the whole family about to go back purely to try and help the team win their first European Championship. Two weeks out before I was jumping on the plane, I had a scan, you know, just as part of their medical, to realise that I'd had a a disc bulge in my neck. And they asked me if I'd be getting stingers or anything. I was like, yeah, you know, that's what rugby players do, they get stingers. But I guess throughout the four years before that, I've been getting, I guess you can call it a stinger, where you get caught in a funny position, but I couldn't feel my arms and legs for a couple of minutes. And they're like, well, what happened? And I was like, oh, you know, I'd go away after a couple of minutes and I'll just keep playing. And they're like, well, you know why? And then they got the scan results back and those bulges were compressing on, on my spinal cord. And that's why I was kind of getting both legs as well. So, you know, I, I get goosebumps even talking about it now, like how close I was to having something you know, really serious, a really serious injury. Um, of course, you know, everyone's telling you, well, okay, the neck, your spine, these are really important things. You, you need to retire. And I was like, okay, if I didn't have to have the operation, then maybe I would retire, but I needed the operation whether I was retiring or not. So in my mind, it was all, if I'm going to need the operation, I want to rehab this better than I could ever possibly do. So I needed a mindset of really nailing that you know, that recovery. And there's no better mindset that like, I'm returning to play. I'm going to, re- you know, there'd be a few people doubting whether I can get to a certain level again at the age of, you know, 38. What the hell am I doing post such a serious injury? But that was my mindset. And, you know, I worked extremely hard through that rehabilitation and I want to return to play and and achieve my goal of, you know, helping the, the Kobe Steels in Japan sort of win back-to-back championships. So, I did that, and you're right, it was, it was my mindset. I returned to Japan. I had this uh, sort of crazy new focus, and, and you'd, something I learned through the end of my career, you actually need sort of more short-term focuses or things to motivate and drive you. So that's why I kind of went to J- Japan after France because I kind of tried there. I was like, okay, I need a new motivation. You went to Japan, and then... It's just getting tougher and tougher to find things to, to motivate you. And this was a, a perfect opportunity to do that. So I went back to Japan, played six games, and, and then uh, COVID hit and came back to New Zealand. But that was my mindset. I'm, I'm going to return return to play, return to play, not just be part of the team, but to, to be the best player out on the field, which is something that I, was driving me uh, every time I, I put the boots on. How are you now physically off the back of that rehab and that injury? 
Good, yeah. Strong, not getting, uh, you know, those sensations anymore. Obviously, I returned to play in Japan. Got all my full movement. It's extremely strong. So it's not going to be something that's going to bother me later in life. It's I, I did the rehab. I did the work. Yeah, I need to continue to strengthen it. But, you know, that's reassuring that, you know, it, it's not going to come back to bite me in the ass um, later on. And, and same with same with all my injuries. You know, the body feels good. That's, that's the scary thing. Um, and it always does feel good when when you're not playing or training. It's it's actually when you go back to the team environment and they start doing contact work again. I was like, okay, yeah, sweet. That's uh, that's my retired. So I'm going to mildly disagree with you there. I I feel fucking terrible. Uh, <laughs> it's the difference I'm between a forward yeah. and a back. You know, I I've got more bulging discs than spine. Actually, so, <laughs> <laughs> my spinal column can't touch it because there's a bulge in the way of the spinal column yeah. bulging the other bulge. So it's not. It's not oh, yeah, I've I was got, lucky enough to get it fixed. I've got a question for you actually, just because that's twice you talked about your kind of. And I know Alex, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go on the kind of a journey and cover all the things you've done. But I'm interested twice you talked about psychology and kind of your mentality. You've obviously got an incredible amount of mental toughness, and yes, you were looking for short term goals. Is that something you've always had or is it something you, you've actually worked on really hard with somebody? Yeah, it's, it's something that I've had to really work on sort of the back end of my career. And, and to be honest, I wish it was something I started early on in my career. You know, when I first started, yeah, it was professional, but it was still, you know, elements of, of that amateur era. To be honest, it's actually something I really love and I can see Tins trying to hide a smile, that sort of professional but amateur um, playing for Best you know for those reasons it was it was good fun but if you were going to explain to a teammate that you hey I'm just going to go see the you know the head coach the psychologist they kind of look at you funny going mate are you all right what's wrong with you you're a little bit nutty is you know what what's wrong to the end of my career where a player you know, would say to you, are you not seeing the the psychologist? Why not? And do you want to be the best player that you can possibly be? You, you need to be seeing him. So it just became norm. And so I, I learned that sort of halfway through my career. And, you know, I think a lot of my sort of longevity and playing at the highest level had to do with, with my mind, my controlling the mind. You know, this as soon as we realized we're spending hours in the gym, we're spending hours on the trading paddock we're spending so much time worrying about what we're putting into our bodies sort of nutrition wise um why aren't we spending this time on you know a sort of a mental strength and as soon as i sort of adapted that i just felt like i was in so much more uh control of of my destiny control of my mind actually getting excited about performing in high pressure situations um, having all the tools in place to, to be able to deal with with moments out in the game and and in the training week as well. So, yeah, it's it's something I, I really worked hard on. When Hask retired, he and I did a did a show, and I remember saying to him, "There aren't many players who get carried out on the shoulders of, you know, their 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 peers and their and their teammates lifting the World Cup." Um, and he was like, "Yeah, no, I, I get that." I, I wondered with you as someone who was carried out on the shoulders of your teammates with the World Cup, is that feeling as good as everyone would think it would be? Or given what you've been saying about your mindset and about the, the almost the, the sort of the fact that your competitive edge is never fully satisfied, that there's always the want of a little bit more. Do you look back now and think rugby completed it, or do you think, oh, well, you know, well, maybe just a tweak here and a tweak there? For international rugby, like that was the pinnacle, and I've you know, talked a little bit about, you know, the previous three World Cups and, you know, the disappointment that we had with those, both as a team perspective, but then on an individual level in 2011, being injured and in a critical part of the tournament and not being able to continue. So to finish on such a high was, it was like a fairy tale finish. And honestly, it was, I'm just so blessed to be able to finish on such a high like that. Obviously celebrated that, uh, enjoyed that, embraced it, you know, because a lot of work and sacrifice and dedication, everything had gone into that moment. So just to focus on what's next, you know, I wouldn't do it justice. So I really wanted to, to enjoy that moment. But as soon as I got to France, I was like, okay, right, what's next? You know, what's my next challenge? And to even be in, in situations like playing a European final, playing a, a top 14 final in New Camp in Barcelona in front of 100,000 people. I just felt new ways to kind of to grow the team or grow the environment. 
that whole sort of winning mindset, I just wasn't satisfied. Like good enough for me is, is not good enough. Like I want, I want to be the best every single time that I'm out on the field. And, you know, that was my real driving force um, wherever I went. And, you know, if I managed to inspire and help the teams, you know, that I was involved with, then, then that was great. So I guess it's more so now when I know that I've finished those challenges in rugby that I can reflect back and go, okay, actually, I know I enjoyed it for a month or so, but the the uniqueness and, and um, how special that 2015 World Cup was, um, yeah, it was yeah a fairy tale finish. Just on what you were saying about 2011 and and obviously your dream of having that Johnny Wilkinson moment of kicking a goal to win a World Cup. Do you still wake up with nightmares and cold sweat that Stephen Donald stole your dream? <laughs> the Beaver, oh, the Beaver. Uh, mate, he's an absolute champion. Um, <laughs> it couldn't have happened to a nicer person. Like, he was getting wrung out like maybe two years before that for you know missing a touch find or something as simple. And you know, we're pretty mad about rugby here in New Zealand. Um, you know, so he was you know tormented by some of the press that he was getting a couple of years earlier. And he's just the nicest bloke. So there wasn't a part of me that was like, oh man, I wish that was me. You know, I'm, I'm fully supportive. Um, of him and the team and, and the success that they did had. If anything, it drove me. Like, that was going to be my last World Cup. And I was like, when I got injured, even before that moment, I was like, nah, bugger it. I'm going to I'm gonna put everything into the next four years. I'm going to have one more go at this. And and that was my driving force. It's like, cool, he can have his magic moment, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something um, in four years' time that is going to make the reason for this the seriousness of this injury uh, worthwhile. So... Um, mate and you know to be able to actually do that four years later but now nah, beaver he thoroughly deserved that he went on and to bath, bath and all i remember is a day on a day on the smash and rugby tackling me in the middle of, into the middle of the road and into a roundabout and he wouldn't let me go he just kept running after me and chopping my legs away i'm like beaver you've never made this many tackles in your life can you leave me alone i'm going he's like you're not mate come back I'm like i am i'm going it was in 1987 first little trip to southbridge and i, I just wonder yeah, I know you've probably asked this a million times, but when you look back now to the first, your first, I want, I'd love you to have been wearing, you know, ankle high boots and, you know, a shirt that's four sizes too big, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, when you look back at where it all started, how do you reflect on the whole journey? Was it always your destiny or was there a moment in your life where it clicked? You know, how, how did you get from me high to a grasshopper to one of the, one of the greatest? Yeah, I mean, it was. I never actually thought it would happen. It was always a dream of mine, and I don't remember a lot as a five-year-old, but I still remember the '87 World Cup. I was five years old. The inaugural Rugby World Cup being hosted by Australia and New Zealand, and the very first All Black game of the tournament was the All Blacks against Italy. And John Kerwin, um, he got a pass off the kickoff, and he ran the length of the field, beat about eleven players, and it just blew my mind. I was like holy shit, this guy is my hero. So I was straight out in the backyard trying to score tries like JK. I was like, yep. The All Blacks went on to win it. You know, there's a moment that I remember, captain at the time, David Kirk holding the William Webb Ellis above his head and something was installed in me then. I was like, man, I, I want to be an All Black. You know, this is my dream. I grew up in a, a little country town of 700 people. So All Blacks aren't supposed to come from little country towns like this. So it was always just a dream. Even though I was trying to emulate my heroes growing up, I never actually took it seriously. Like, oh man, I've got to do this, 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 this to be an All Black. I was just having fun, playing for the right reasons. And then, you know, all of a sudden, I think I was 19. And I was like, oh, actually, I'm, I'm actually not too bad at this. Uh, you know, I started getting selected in, in a few teams. I, I didn't play any sort of high school, um, national teams, but then... When I was 20, uh, I got called into Robbie Deans' office and he was, he was like, do you want to be a crusader? I was like, yeah, of course. It's a dream of mine. You know, go back to my parents' house. I've got all the crusader posters on my wall. This is, uh, you yeah, know, I'd love to be a crusader. He goes, do you know who you're competing against? And I was like, yeah, shit, yeah, Mertz. He's my hero. Uh, Aaron Major, you know, these, uh, these absolute legends of the game. He goes, yeah, well, I want you to start ahead of those guys next year. And I'm like, what? Well, I started laughing. I was like, come on, mate. He goes, no, you're not here just to fill in numbers. And in my mind, I was just here to fill in numbers. I was happy. But I walked out of that meeting 
going, he's just given me an opportunity to play rugby professionally alongside my heroes. And now he's telling me that he wants me to start ahead of these guys. Man, he's, he's showing me a lot of faith. I'm going to return this faith and I'm going to work harder than I ever have. So man, it was only 12 months early that I started uh, going to the gym and doing weights and even thinking about that I could potentially play, play rugby professionally. So I did, had a great off season. And then the very first game, they were reading the, the team list. And number nine, Justin Marshall, number 10, Dan Carter. And I was like, oh, no, they must have made a mistake because, you know, Mertz is just behind me. They're supposed to say Mertz, who's, you know, the hero um, down there in Christchurch, my hero. It was, it was my name and it was really bizarre. And then straight after that meeting, Mertz, he came to me. He was the first person to shake my hand. He goes, mate, I'm going to help you all week. If I can help you with anything throughout the week, I, you know, I'm here for you. And it just blew my mind. I was like, oh, this is crazy. It's like when I get to a leadership level, I want that kind of leadership where I'm there to help the younger players. So he helped me out. Um, I was getting kind of not bagged, but everyone, you know, all the public and supporters were like, who's this young kid, you know, starting a, a head of our hero. I was so nervous. I remember five minutes before kickoff, I was in the change room just like pretending to, to kick an imaginary ball because I was so stressed about what happens if I miss a kick and got Mertz sitting on the bench. Anyway, I shanked my first two kicks pretty much in front. It was embarrassing. I could just hear the whole crowd at Lancaster Park in Christchurch going, get this guy off. Thankfully, or not so thankfully, because he's a good mate of mine, but one of the major brothers got injured and Mertz came on. I went to 12 and I could just relax. He goes, do you want to keep kicking? I'm like, no, you kick, man. Seriously. You know, went on to have an awesome game, um, scored a couple of tries, but that was... That was the start start of it all, and and then I was surrounded with just such amazing people, and I could just I could just play, be myself, and obviously had a an amazing year that year. Went on to to play for the All Blacks for the first time, and and you know go on to to play at a World Cup in my first year of being a professional rugby player. So it all happened really quickly. It was um, and then you know I kind of talked a little bit about you know, that first test match and getting that taste of wanting to be, you know, not just another all black, but an all black great. And it's it just, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Wasn't your first game to watch the, from the bench, watch New Zealand lose to England in Wellington? Oh my God, thank God. Um, I didn't get on that game. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> and not a bad game that tins. Yeah. Well done, mate. Um, <laughs> bravo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying oh, to get no. you nightmares for the oh, actually it's the it's the day so you definitely oh, won't no, you won't sleep it, later. Plenty of worse uh, worse games than that, mate. But that honestly, just sitting on the bench, just seeing the intensity of Test match footy for the first time, I was kind of there's a part of me that would love to be on, but there was actually another part of me I was like, oh, you know, this looks tough, man. England are England are on fire, and I've already talked about how I looked up to Johnny and those those moments, um, and. All of a sudden, I got to see it firsthand. Um, was was incredible. Thankfully, didn't get on and, and played the following week. Yeah. His, kick, his kicking that day was ridiculous. I, obviously, oh, I, held, mate, I was, I was holding I was holding the ball, and it was it was ridiculous. Oh, I know. Yeah, it was unbelievable. Um, the wind, unbelievable. Question, Dan. Just where did your like dedication come from? Like, was there members of your family like committed to sport? Because to to be given an opportunity not to play the age group like um, the All Blacks and stuff and not had that mentality. How did you then, someone pull calls you into office and you go, right, I'm going to gonna dig in. That's quite a, like a feat for a 20-year-old who nece- not necessarily not had that. Where does your influence from that stuff come from? Good question because I've never really had it as a child. Like I was just carefree. You know, my childhood shaped me into the, the person I am. So I'm extremely sort of grateful for any opportunity that I get. I understand that Nothing happens by chance, you know, so work ethic, you know, seeing my father and the long hours and work that he put in. We lived in a farming community just to see how hard the farms used to work. So something was ingrained then. Of, okay, if, you, if you're going to achieve anything in life, you're going to have to work bloody hard for it. So that was that was a key point. And, and then just being sort of really grateful. So when you're given opportunities, like when Robbie gave me an opportunity, you're going to repay the favor of, um, you know, that, that faith that he showed in me. And then probably wasn't until really that first test match where it became a little bit of an obsession. It's like, okay, cool. Right. This is the dream of mine. It's just become a reality. I could be happy now and kind of do what's next. Um, but that wasn't something was installed in me on that day. And it just flicked the switch. It was like, right, man, I'm, 
this is this is me. This is where I want to get to, and I'm going to have to work hard. I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to have to evolve as a player. I'm going to have to do all these things to to achieve that. I guess you know, for a for a young twenty year old that I guess a little bit might be a little bit more sort of relaxed in in his way that. You know, I don't think you need to force to try and find what that driving factor is, but you do need some kind of vision or purpose to get to the highest level or even just to have the drive to try and get to that highest level and, and, and high performance, you know, because just being out there and, and just trying to get a little bit better each day, it's, I think you do need some kind of mental drive that's, you know, when times are tough, it's, it's going to push you through those moments. Have you always been the perfect 10 or were you, were you ever the fat kid in the front row or the kid who was in charge of the scoreboard or the halftime oranges? I actually played all my junior rugby number nine. I was always tiny. I didn't have a growth spurt until I was about 18. So I was tiny and obviously the smallest player in the field plays uh, scrum half. So that's where I was. And then in sixth form, so I was about 16, uh, the principal of the school that I went to, Ellesmere College, his son also played halfback, uh, scrum half, number nine. Um, so he pushed me out to 10. He's like, no, no, my son's playing nine. You, you're going out to 10. So, <laughs> Nepotism, I so love it. Play. Yeah. So it happened by a bit of a coincidence. Oh, actually, I quite enjoy this. One position further away from those big sort of forward guys that, you know, were a bit of a different breed. So nice to get a bit of space from them. So I played uh, the next two years at, at 10. And then I started playing professionally. And after that first Crusaders game where I got pushed out to 12, actually I played uh, number 12 for the next two years uh, in the All Blacks and, and Crusaders. Um, and I thought maybe that's my position. Through all those experiences, it was almost molding me to be um, a good number 10 because all of a sudden I was actually enjoying watching players, you know, like Johnny Wilkinson, actually being a play, being able to play alongside the likes of a Mertz or a Carlos Spencer that can play completely different styles of play and here I was just kind of feeding off all this sort of information that was around me so when I did get the chance to finally um, play 10 in a test match I, I felt like I had a lot of knowledge a little bit more maturity I could control a, a game a lot more um, so I, if anything I kind of just stumbled across it in a way but um, there's a whole lot of work that had gone in behind that moment to, to build up my skill set you know my drive um, everything that I needed to to be a good 10. We spoke to Kieran Reid and he was he was head boy material. I I sort of see you as more of a prom king material. Were you were you like were you like good at everything like an all round sort of perfectionist you are now, or were you like behind the bike sheds trying to snog the girls? Like what what, what was your vibe at school? Oh, um, yeah, probably a couple of the, those above ones. So definitely not head boys for materials. I was quite happy just kind of just going going with the flow. Yeah, I was. Yeah, proud of myself for giving everything a go and trying everything. Love cricket, love all sport, really. Just needed <laughs> needed to be active. There's a little bit of a naughty streak in, in me as well. I'm quite mischievous sort of growing up, but always, you know, the, the teacher's pet and, you know, got alongside uh, you know them pretty well. So, yeah, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not, to be honest. <laughs> no, no. When you said you wanted to give everything a go, I thought we were back behind the bike sheds again. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Very good. No, I was talking about sport there. Yeah. yeah, sport. Sorry, yeah, sport. I, ha I know that Haskins is desperate to shred what has been a 20-year golden PR campaign that surrounds you, <laughs> but we'll, we'll try and keep it on the straight and narrow as we go. At some point, we'll talk about Moe, a visit to Moe and drinking from bottles of champagne and trying to play the guitar and you're in your playing jersey. We'll get to that, don't worry. Okay, beautiful. I'd expect nothing, to be honest. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask you, watching you as a player from, from miles away, you, you always look very cool, very calm. There was a, a smile always readily accessible. And I, it's interesting you say Johnny was your hero, who, who probably for large parts of his career didn't enjoy that, that freedom out there. Was that you? Were you always that relaxed and enjoying it as you went, or did that belie nerves and fear and doubt, etc.? It was always me. You know, that, that's my personality, and, you know, these boys know me well enough to know that's the kind of person that I am. But in saying that, you know, I was shitting myself on the inside. Um, you know, I was nervous, but always knew that, you know, nerves were okay. It's okay to be nervous. I was actually got excited with um, when I was nervous, I went through a whole Super Rugby tournament. It must have been about sort of 2013 or something, and I just wasn't getting nervous before the game. I was like, "Oh no, I've lost the love for the the game. This is it. This is the end." All of a sudden, we got to the playoffs, and I got nervous before the semi final. I'm like, "Yes, there it is. Perfect. This is good. And one of the best games, um, you know, that I played that that tournament." So. 
you know, to, to be able to, to have this sort of relaxed persona, I needed to work hard through the week. I was like, I, because if I hadn't done the work, the preparation, then I would have got to the game and I would have been nervous for the wrong reasons and, and I would have shown it. You know, I would have been anxious. I wouldn't have been myself. Um, so I always brought it back to my preparation. So when I get to game day, nervous or not, I've done the work. Now just go out there and, and be yourself and, you know, express yourself and, and enjoy it. So um, being able to be myself came off the back of a lot of hard work. When you say you you relied on your preparation, is that is that watching film on opposition, or is that just basically getting your body in the right shape, or you know making sure that how you see the game in attacking, where you've picked up weaknesses, is, is it from that side, or is it all of the above, just put put into a nice package? Yeah, all of the above, but see, I was not very good at looking at the opposition. I kind of always focus focus on me and, and my game. So every Sunday, I would write down my, my week plan and it's almost down to the hour of each day. It was it was that sort of crazy. It's like, yeah, cool. I want to have full control of my week, even to the extent where my day off, if it was a Wednesday, I would write down what I'm doing on that day off, you know, so I had focus. So I wasn't just drifting. And, and there I was able to control my mind as well because I'm not just going to waste half a day thinking about the game because I'm doing this and this. But I know the importance of having balance. So actually I need to play golf or I need to spend time with my family. So I was almost putting moments like that uh, into my week in terms of my preparation I'm more talking about right I need to have this many kicks on a Monday I need to recover extremely well on a Monday Tuesday so this is what I'm going to do the formula for the next two days actually I'm going to spend you know this hour in my book um, actually you know that's really going to drain me so actually I need to go jump on my decks and do a bit of DJing just to clear my mind for a little bit I can see hair smiling um, you any good so just just things like that. No, I'm hopeless. I'm hope, absolutely hopeless. But um managed to get a bit of free kit out of it, old Hask and I. <laughs> so it was all worthwhile. No, I, I was right into it, actually. I, I got to a stage where I didn't have the drive to go out um, to bars and clubs after games. But after a game, you know, you're full of adrenaline. You can't you go lie in bed and you just stare at the ceiling for four hours. So I was like, man, I need something, you know, because I don't want to go out. So I was like, DJing, perfect. I can't sing, can't play a musical instrument, but I love music. DJing is, is perfect. So I got lessons and I used to sit after a game, go back home, and I just poorly, I must admit, mix, mix music, have a little six-pack of beers, kind of go through them. Next thing you know, you're, you're three hours uh, into mixing music and it was just such an amazing sort of release of, you know, that that excitement and adrenaline that was in your body and saved me having to sort of take a sleeping pill and, you know, force myself to sleep. So that was, yeah, that's how the, the love of DJing started. I've never actually told anyone this, but it's actually Dan who got me into DJing because we were out, when I was out in New Zealand for the Highlanders, and I got to know him and spoke to him, he actually hooked me up with a guy called Morgan Donoghue, who's a absolute legend of a guy who used to... Um, Run Serato and now he does stuff within music and uh, Dan actually introduced me went to bat for me and was like listen I know you're not a massive uh, England rugby fan but I've got this really annoying English mate you couldn't hook him up with a bit of free free kit and and and, and Morgan looked after me like a dream and, and is still mates now basically got it for me and it's actually during the 2014 trip when we were there with uh, England because Stuart Lancaster didn't want any of us going out we thought, sort of felt a bit oppressed I went contacted Morgan again and he actually got me a set of decks that I played in the room and I just stayed out of trouble. I never left the hotel. All I did was exactly what down. I was just in the room with my Beats pill, mixing. Everyone was like, you're coming out. I was like, nah, I don't want to be out. I don't want to be caught doing anything. I'm just going to stay in the room. So he saved my career and got me into DJ. So, uh, you know, kudos mate, to it's you. Been it's been actually, I'm, huge. I'm really glad that you've you know, continued with your DJ, mate, because Morgan's hooked a few people up with gear and there's nothing worse than just using it for six months and then, oh, yeah, what, what's my next hobby? So we often talk about you, Hask, and, and the way that you've, you've taken to it. So well done. Make sure, Cheers, uh, and obviously you've downloaded his new song, Make Me Feel. Uh, <laughs> he's now released it. I've got to plug that for you, Hask. I've listened exactly, to it. Mate, so I right. appreciate When's that. it out? It's out on uh, next Friday. Next Friday. I've finished four other ones as well. A couple of others have been signed as well, so I'm quite excited to see how they uh, they come. But this is not about me. It's about Dan. And I've got this one, <laughs> well, I've got this one question I want to ask you is your attitude, like, I, I, I don't know why I'm surprised because um, I think it is because of your, like, really friendly exterior, because you did seem relaxed, that everything you've said and how considered you were 
And I know behind every kind of successful person there is this kind of mentality. But I genuinely thought that you that you had such a natural ability. That, yes, I knew you were professional, but I, it didn't occur to me that you you micromanaged and detailed your life so much. Because also your other character trait is to your great bloke off the field. And only the, most people I know who have your level of dedication and focus can't marry up the both. You're quite a rarity. Like you see it in certain sports that like the guys who talk the talk, they walk the walk and they enjoy life. Lots of sportsmen I know with your mentality, they can't focus. Like for example, like Johnny Wilkinson being a great example of someone who had incredible dedication. He's the first one to admit he didn't, he didn't enjoy it. Was it, did he go off and celebrate off the field? No. Was he so consumed with the next job? Yes. But you're somebody and you saw it in your retirement. How many people turn out and said, Dan Carr, unbelievable player, but equal amount turn around and said, what a f- hero of a bloke. Like, what an absolute hero. And that's quite, quite rare. But it's more of a statement. Really. I'm just very surprised that you've managed to marry up that, that ability. I mean, were you aware of that? Or, or you know, did you always try to make sure that you enjoyed it off the field as well? I guess it comes down to, you know, your values, sort of what drives you. And, you know, a big part of, you know, for me was, um, you know, I really cared about other people. So um, I wanted to spend time with, you know, the, the, the new guys in the team, get alongside them, have a few beers with them. I understand, understood the importance of celebrating success. It's something that not all sort of professional teams or people do. They work so hard and they're like, right, what's to the next? They're like, hold on, mate, we've got to celebrate this. We worked our bloody butts off. So I was a real stalwart for that. My favourite time of the week was in the changing sheds right after a game. You know, you look at your teammate in the eye with the beer. It's like, man, that was an awesome week. You know, great result. You know, I just love that moment. You know, there's probably images of me running around, dancing, jumping around in the change sheet after 2015 where I'm, you know, because I knew that that moment, that changing shed, that that hour, yeah. hour and a half that you get, you can't take that away. And it was always my favourite part of the week. I understood the importance of balance, you know, so I didn't want rugby to be all consuming. So I needed hobbies, um, things outside of rugby that I'd put focus on and, and just take my mind away from rugby, whether it was DJing, you know, family has been a big, big one recently in the last sort of decade and, and using that as an amazing tool to, to escape rugby, I guess hasn't happened naturally. I th- it's helped because of the, the person that I am, but also the values and, and the importance that I, I put on, you know, things, things like that. So did it ever nearly consume? Did you ever lose the balance? The point where you were like, Christ, I'm getting so paranoid, like things like, you know, 2009 World Cup, all these other, you know, things that didn't go, 2007 World Cup, things didn't go well. Did it almost ever tip you over to the point where you lost that and almost went in a bit inside yourself? Oh, mate, there's a, some great examples. So 2007 uh, was probably the worst year that I've ever had in terms of not enjoying myself, playing for, for the wrong reasons. So I take myself back to 2003, First year playing professionally, I'm at a World Cup. We just lost the semi final to Australia. We're in the changing rooms, and I'm looking around. And I was gutted. You know, I didn't get on the field. I was on the bench. I was gutted. But I looked around the room, and you know, these guys were in tears. You know, they were distraught. They knew that that was probably going to be their last, you know, World Cup opportunity. And I was like, man, this is kind of a big deal. These World Cups. I'm going to do everything that I can in the next four years to to be part of a winning World Cup team and that was my focus and I had some great years uh, in between sort of 2005, 2006 were some of my best years and I was like right World Cup yeah I'm going to stop drinking I'm going to put everything into rugby I'm just going to be this amazing rugby player and I lost the enjoyment and I felt like I was playing for the wrong reasons and and that showed on the field I, I wasn't playing with freedom that I was the previous two years and it was an amazing sort of learning curve I was like whoa okay hold on you know, when I went back and sort of reviewed the year, I was like, man, I was missing a lot of the things that I pride myself on, balance of my life, enjoying, celebrating success, things like that. So that was a real learning curve for me. But it almost flipped to the other side where I like to sort of make people happy and a kind of a nice guy that I found myself saying yes to too much. You know, I was like, oh, yeah, no sorry, yeah, yes, yes, yes. And, and started getting close to like, hold on, this is sort of draining me, draining my energy, actually – got to be rude every now and then to or, or say, learn to say no to things because you know my focus and my direction is here okay and yeah I'm doing a whole lot of little things that are sort of stopping me or taking time away from where I want to get to so I guess that's you know both flip sides of you know when I took things too seriously to, to the other extent as well so there was a an avenue that I, I managed to find that was in between you could do sort of bits of both. 
when you talk about how committed and, and consumed you were by rugby, did that rub off into, I mean, do you want to win at Tiddlywinks? And do you dip for the line if you're racing someone up an escalator, et cetera? Or were you very good at putting a massive wall of rugby and competition is one thing and the rest of life I'm actually pretty easy coming, easy go? Um, no, no, no. I have a little bit of an obsession with winning and you know, I almost for our children those days because they got this competitive streak and, and you know, my beautiful wife, Anna, who's um, a hockey player, she's got just the same sort of attitude and drive. We're so competitive to the extent we can't play sport against each other. You know, she's quite good at tennis. I'm not, we'll go play, but then we won't talk to each other for three days afterwards because we're just at each other. And that's kind of rubbed off onto the children now. Like my oldest son, sort of Marco, mate, he's so competitive. He's having tantrums. I'm trying to teach him all these sort of – there's part of me that loves that competitiveness. So I'm like, yeah, mate, go out there and win. But there's a part of me of, as well It's like, come on, you know, it's, winning's not everything. Um, even though in my mind I was thinking, man, what am I doing? Did your nose saying? grow like Pinocchio? Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, winning's not everything. <laughs> yeah, pull them aside, mate. Loving that, but just <laughs> dial, it, dial it down a notch. Dial it down a yeah, notch. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah, it is. Yeah, I'm extremely competitive with with everything I do, and I guess that's the the challenge and something that I've embraced for this next chapter of my life. Just actually learning about you know that winning mindset, that breaking down the things that I've learnt throughout my career, and and you know taking on the, this next chapter. I'm, I'm, that's why I'm excited about you know what's next. I know you will have spoken about Lions 05 a number of times. It's Lions year. We're all getting very ex- excited up here. I was lucky enough to be there in 05. It was a, from a Lions perspective, it was dire and terrible. But that second test, I remember, I don't, I don't know if you've ever watched it back, but I remember Gareth Thomas scoring in about the third minute. And I, I just, this is it. This is happening. This is, and I didn't actually get out of my chair for the next 77 minutes, I don't think. I just sort of <laughs> sat and watched it. Stuart Barnes said afterwards, I'm trying not to overhype this, but I don't ever remember a more complete performance from a fly half. I mean, it was sort of wizardry at work. Did you know in the game, as it was unfolding, this is, I've kind of, I've got the, I've got the power, so to speak. I mean, do, do you, do you look back on that game and just think that was hot to trot? I didn't, to be honest. I don't even know how many points I'd scored. I didn't want to take too much in, into play. Whereas, you know, 2015 World Cup, I talked about it. I was in the moment. I was, yeah. you know, I was in control there. Whereas this one, I was just playing with freedom. There was a lot that had happened leading into that week. You know, our leader, Tanarumanga and Kivi getting caught in, in that incident with Drico and, and things like that. So we had some sort of driving, internal driving forces, you know, towards that game. And we knew that the Lions were going to come back at us like so hard after the first test match, you know, us sort of beating them there. So, you know, funny you bring up that that try by Gareth. And I remember sitting on the post and I was like, wow, man, we're in for a, a tough game and this is going to be close and then after that moment I don't know like you're always striving for a perfect game you'll never have a perfect game no one will ever but that's something you're striving for and I don't know if you've heard people talk about flow and you just kind of get in the zone and I just felt like I was, I was in the zone and everything that I tried was working and, and I felt fast and you know accurate and just really clear I'm just back backing my instincts and everything was coming off and and I got to the end of the game and I was like, oh, cool, man. We just won the series. I hadn't really thought of it on a personal level. I was just really proud of, of the team sort of playing well together and, and, and you know, sealing up uh, a Lions series. I was, I was stoked. It wasn't until I got dragged to the, the media conference afterwards. I went straight in and, and did some media. And, you know, with the Lions series, there's more media than usual, but there was a lot of media and they were like, man. And they just started going, you know, talking about this performance. And they were like, do you know how many points you scored? I was like, I have no idea. Someone said, oh, 33. I was like, oh, really? Shit, that's not bad. Um, oh, it must have been a pretty good game. And that's when I kind of realized, okay, this, uh, I think that game was pretty special. You know, it wasn't at all. And they went to the changing sheds after doing media and I was sitting next to uh, good mate Ma. And uh, with every game, we have a competition to see who gets the most ticks, you know. So who played better? Or let's see who gets the most ticks. You know, we normally get, you know, maybe 15, 16 ticks and you know, he'll get 18. Like, ah, fuck, got you, bro, you know, sort of yeah. thing. Um, winding you up. So I was like, okay, let's play. And I knew I had a pretty good game after coming from the, the press conference. 
So I turned on my phone and it just went ballistic, you know, like he got his usual sort of 20 to 30 texts and I was in the hundreds and everyone was just coming out congratulating me on such an amazing game. So I guess to answer your question, in the game, I didn't realise how well it was going and whatever I tried was turning to gold. It wasn't until afterwards that I kind of realised, okay, this is, yeah, this is, you know, pretty pretty unique, pretty special. You know, the, the closest that I got to, you know, a perfect game. Um, so, mate, and, and I guess just to do it on that stage, you know, people knew who I was in, in New Zealand because I've been playing for the All Blacks for a couple of years, but I guess that put me onto the, the global sport stage of you know people overseas starting to sort of recognize the I guess the capabilities that I could have um you know as a rugby player obviously because you were playing against Johnny Wilkinson did you did that have a play a role into it why you wanted to put put on even magic you know a magical display you felt like because when you meet your heroes and somebody you look up to because you're so competitive you want to meet your heroes and vanquish them like did, is that does that have a special reason into it <laughs> no not at all it's um you know he, he played 12 in the first test match so that was quite cool you always want to play against the, the best in the world and guys you aspire to but it's never it was never a driving force for me it's like right now i'm, I'm going to outplay him because very rarely you know you don't have control over the way he's going to play or you can control the way you're going to play and basically i want to help this team win so i'm going to play well and um, so there was never like a one-on-one. I, I've seen it so many times where, um, you know, players are playing against me. They're just trying to take me out. They're just trying to write, this is a one-on-one battle. And I was like, okay, sweet ass, we can turn it into a battle, but that's not where my focus is. You know, I'm just going to do my job and I'm not trying to do it better than you. I'm trying to do it better than everyone on this this field. You know, it's just at such a different level. So, you know, obviously I, I love playing against, you know, the likes of Johnny um, when, you know, you know, when he was playing and, um, but it was never like a, a rivalry that I'm going to try and, you know, play better than him this week. It was never a sort of personal one-on-one thing. But it's, it's not something you can do as a fly-off, really. You're not really concerned about what your other fly-off is doing. You've just got to manage your team, manage your team better. You know you're having a dream game when you can hit an 80-metre spiral kick. No one hits spiral kicks. <laughs> Even in 2005, no one hit them. And then you you did that, you did an 80, literally five-metre channel you know, Dave Orwood, what he says, kicking the arrow straight down the five meter channel, and you just ping one 80 meters. The commentator is like, they might have him in trouble. But that's what Dan Carter does when he's in trouble. <laughs> and it's just like, it's yeah. going to be a long day for the Lions. Oh, mate. Yeah, I don't think I pulled many spirals out after that. So I must have been in some kind of form or flow or something. To, to Do you think that was, just, it was just, it was, you were just playing youth there. That is just youth rugby, isn't it? You, 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 you what, you're 25 at the time and, you're not thinking about how you're playing. You're just you're just playing the game as you see it, and and it's one of those days where everything everything came off for you. you. Should have chipped it more. I reckon you'd have scored a few more. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I just um, I just yeah, I love that part of my career where you're just playing with such freedom. You don't really understand the context of uh, the importance of the game, a line series. I'd learnt that you know leading into the line series, and then sort of seeing the crowd and the people, the fans, but you're still um, quite sort of innocent and it's like okay I'm just going to go out there and play and you do with it play with that freedom um, that you know I guess you, it was harder to find that freedom you, know, you became a lot more reliant on your experiences your time your your learnings that you've um, gone through as the longer you, your career went on and, and that's you know I always pride myself man I just absolutely nailed that game it wasn't because I scored three tries or two tries it's because I controlled the game beautifully my communication was clear I was making all the right decisions I attacked at the right times whereas back in 2005 I was like right let's go out there throw the ball around have fun play we'll see how it goes um and that all right yeah as you mentioned you've been in the All Blacks for a couple of years then was it easy breaking into that All Black squad? Because there were some big old personalities who'd been around for a while when you stepped in was it welcoming and friendly or did you have to push your way in as a young upstart no it was it was actually really welcoming to be honest you know there was still a lot of learnings that needed to be happening in the, in the all black environment you know there were still traits from the amateur days that were still you know relevant and in, in those early couple of years but like everyone was welcoming it was john mitchell and robbie deans were the the coaches back then and i'd had robbie through the crusader days and one of his real strengths was giving the younger guys opportunities you know that could um, rub a few of the experienced guys up the wrong way and you know they would make you know trainings quite challenging for you so you had to work for everything that you got to, to you really had to earn your respect 
you know, just because you've achieved something at super rugby level didn't guarantee respect in, in the all black environment. And to be honest, I wouldn't want it any other way. You know, sometimes I, I see young guys coming up through the academies, uh, they come into the team and they're like, right, you know, you should respect me. They're saying this, that. Whereas, you know, one of my values is like, you got to earn respect, you got to put the time in. Um, and then, you, you know, eventually your time will come, you know, when you can you know, say, say what you're thinking and being able to drive in and direct the team. So I'm glad I sort of had that, you know, that, that, that path to the top, but it was, it was great. Um, you know, I gave the example of Mertz sort of helping me on my first sort of professional game. So there were a lot of, I guess, great sort of moments like that where you soon realize that, you know, that the team is the most important thing. So whether you're a new kid or not, you know, you're welcome into, into this environment. You know that the book, The Legacy, that obviously talks about kind of the All Blacks changing. You obviously were in pre that period of time, like you've talked about, where there were still those old school traits. Is it true that there was such a, you know, a huge transformation for what it was when you first came in to what we see now, to what is bred? Was it universal or was it, was it being overplayed? In, in your mind? No, like I still remember we had one of our worst Tri Nations in 2004, you know, court sessions afterwards. Like, why are we sort of celebrating our worst um, you know, performing sort of Tri Nations? A lot of sort of old school mentality um, to the extent where Wayne Smith was going to walk away from the, the environment. He's like, I don't, I don't want to be part, you know, this game is supposed to be professional. So, him and the, and the coaching group, uh, Graham Henry, uh, the Tana was the coach, uh, the captain. Sorry, then he had like so Richie McCaw. They brought this team together, and they're like, we need to make some changes. And that's when we started sort of creating our, our own identity. That's when we started the planning for our own haka, talking about, okay, this is our time, this is our moment. These are the our values as All Blacks, and the mentality changed a lot. And they got rid of a lot of the the older players in the squad. They even actually brought back some other older players that had been part of the group for a while that could could really add to the environment. And we went on the Northern Hemisphere tour in, in that November. And that was the first time I played 10, you know, because this was the start of this new sort of vision and generation that, you know, the management and senior players had put together. And, you know, that was the start of, you know, I guess the environment that the All Blacks is today. And we've had a lot of learnings along the way in terms of, you know, 2007, we had an amazing learning there of actually we we're always really successful, but we hated pressure. We, we didn't know how to perform under pressure. So we had the environment ready, but we weren't testing ourselves and thriving on those, those moments of, you know, high performance and performing under pressure and having the tools in place. So, as the years went on, we had some amazing highs and lows and learnings. And through, for me, that, that sort of change in 2004, the learnings we had in 2007, um, that really shaped and moulded uh, the team it is today and a big part of the reason that you know, we're able to win back-to-back World Cups. The beautiful thing about your career is the trajectory and the way, certainly from an all backs perspective, the way that it finishes with 2015, but you, you've touched on 2007 a couple of times. I mean, do you look back at that now, grateful for what it gave you and what you learned and went on, or do you look back now and it still cuts as deep as it did as <clears throat> that picture of you looking forlorn because your groin went or something? I can't remember why you went off in that France game, but there's, there's that picture at full time, which just is a man broken. I guess going back to that image, there was a part of me I'd sort of torn my calf, so I knew that whether we won or lost, it was um, the end of the World Cup for me, probably. So. There was a bit uh, of that sort of individual sort of mindset and disappointment, but also the way that the game was going and the fact that we're kind of looking at each other out on the field, but also on the sideline, like a possum in headlights. You know, no one had any answers behind um, behind the eyes. We were just, we were in shock. We didn't understand what was going on. We didn't have any answers. What we were trying to do wasn't working. We started playing within ourselves and all of, a mo- all of a sudden we realized we, we didn't have the answers um, and we didn't have the tools in place to be able to, to deal with moments like that. So I look back and I'm like, okay, to be honest, I'm thankful we went through that process. You know, as tough as it was at the time, it was probably a changing room after that game, the changing room, the most bleak train, um, changing room ever. It was guys in tears. No one was wanting to look at another one. Everyone was you know, like facing inwards towards the, the change room, towards the wall, because they just didn't want to look at anyone in the eye. 
Um, and it was like that for about half an hour, just, you know, to the extent where we went back to the hotel and I went straight to my room and, you know, I just didn't want to, to face anyone. I was just trying to digest it all in my mind. I was embarrassed. You know, we, we let the, the nation down. Um, thankfully, I got a couple of good mates like Ali Williams and Chris Marceau that came, got me in five in the morning and forced a beer down my, my mouth. I was like, come on, pull your head out of your ass, mate. Let's, uh, you know, we're not going to get a lot of times sort of like this together as a team. So come, come and join us. But you know, looking back now, that, that 2007, there was some just amazing learnings that we got and a big part of the reason that we were able to go like that um, as All Blacks and, and an environment. Could you relate Obviously, you talked about 2003 and you weren't really, you weren't seeing what, and it was the sort of inspiration for you to crack on. Were you then now living what you saw in 2007? That was how you were feeling in yourself, what you saw in 2003. Yeah, well and truly. And and it was this vicious cycle that we used to go through as All Blacks. So four years, you know, would be sort of one of the top teams in the world, expected to win a World Cup. We wouldn't. Okay, right, coaches go. Okay, right, these are the new coaches. you got four years um, to get a World Cup winning team together. Boom, wouldn't happen. Okay, did it for 20 years. And then 2003, obviously in the change room, older guys upset, coaches gone, new coaching group, boom. Went to 2007, all of a sudden I was one of those players that was, you know, devastated and destroyed. Um, right, what's going to happen? We're going to get a new coaching group. Okay, try again. Credit to the New Zealand Rugby Union. They reappointed um, Graham Henry, Steve Hansen, and Wayne Smith. The first time, you know, in over 20 years, and go, actually, we believe in you guys. And we were the worst performing All Blacks team in the history of World Cups. Like, this is going completely against everything that's gone. Go, okay, right, you guys are going to, we believe in you. Okay, yeah, you guys absolutely mucked that World Cup, but. Time to take the learnings. Let's really break it down and then give you um, the tools that you need over the next four years to be able to, to win a, a World Cup. And all of a sudden you go to the 2011 World Cup against France, the final, we're under the pump against the French, just like we were four years earlier. But all of a sudden the players that were out on the field, you know, they were looking at their teammates and they had answers. You know, there's... A, Still no Richie and Conrad. They talk about this moment. They look at each other in the eye and they're like, man, this is what we've been talking about for the last four years. This is the pressure. This, this is exciting. Whereas four years ago, we were shitting ourselves. We were those possums and headlights. So just that, all that work that we've been doing over the four years were for moments like that. And you know, we're able to get through that game and, and become sort of better off uh, you know, f- for that learning that we went through in 2007. And 2015, I mean, you, you've touched on already about the sort of the flow and being in the moment but just for you personally there was a lot more to it than that because you'd, you'd had quite a lot of pressure on you personally going into that tournament as well did were you conscious of that was that something that you were aware of or I, park it move on I, I, you know i know what i'm doing here no i used to i used to pride myself on on not reading the newspaper or not caring what the public is saying or just you know blocking it out you know what's but it's hard to, like as a player, you know, especially with social media, it's going to find its way to you and, and you're going to learn, you know, that, okay, you're not perfect. Actually, a lot of the, the media writing how, you know, you're out of form, you're injury prone, you know, time to, to move on, all these things. So it was quite challenging because I'd had a pretty sort of dream career and hadn't been sort of bagged too much. But there were moments in 2013 and 14 to the extent where I started believing it and I was having huge doubt to the extent where I was telling my sort of wife every second day that I'm going to retire, like I'm done. Like, I think they're right. I think my body, I couldn't string sort of three or four games in a row together without having an, an injury. So I started believing it and I was like, well, why would Steve Hansen, you know, select me? So I separated myself from Steve and we wouldn't talk all that much because I was fear of getting the hard word from him saying, Hey, look, we're moving on. We're going with the younger guys. And it wasn't until I eventually got the ball. Uh, actually, it was a guy, Gilbert Anoka, sort of yeah. a psychologist that works with both of us. He actually saw it happening because he was working with Steve. And Steve had full faith in me that I would be okay in 2015. If he's fit, he's playing. Whereas I was just avoiding anything from him. 
and Berg, I was right, you two need to talk. But was, you know, was like, Steve oh, conscious of the fact that you were stepping away or not? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, he was. He almost forced us together, like as a good friend, you know, with, it's like, mate, you two need to talk, you know, like, so we did. And, and that just gave me so much confidence to hear him say, mate, you get your body right. You do this, you do that. Mate, I trust you. I'm going to, I believe in you. I'm going to back you all the way. And just to get that kind of monkey off my back, I was like, oh, cool. Similar to the Robbie Dean's story of like, mate, he's showing faith in me. I'm going to repay this faith, you know, like, and some more. So that really helped me in my last year in, in 2015 when I went back to Super Rugby and I just, the first half of the year, I was like, okay, just get through 80 minutes, just get through 80 minutes. I didn't care how I, how I played. I wasn't playing that well. Got to the middle of the Super Rugby, I was like, okay, cool. You've just strung six, seven games in a row right now. Actually start applying yourselves. The second half of that um, season, I actually started playing some good rugby, building up some momentum. And then that went into the All Blacks environment and just, it was just all tailored perfectly for that, you know, that fairy tale finish. But it, it was all off the back of, of Steve, you know, showing faith in me and, and believing in me and giving me that confidence that, yeah, that I was able to do that. I love that Dan Carter, one of the best players who's ever played the game, did what most shit players do, try to hide from the coach. Because if, if, <laughs> if he can't get you, he can't drop you. <laughs> I, I, mate, I used to do that in every camp. So, Send him a uh, Team Vinjuice t-shirt. I was going to yeah. say, there's a, there's a singlet on its way. In, in England camp, you'd have a Tuesday afternoon, right? And if basically, if you did a Tuesday morning, after lunch, you'd get a tap on the shoulder and get the hard word from the coach. But my thing was, if I didn't go to lunch, then they couldn't get me to the time I got out for training. But they finally they started getting... You know, Graham Roundtree would start, like you'd see him like, hiding out of corridors, jumping out to get me. <laughs> but I, I love even the best player in the world had the same idea. Just going, oh, yeah, he'd be man. fine. If, you if I never speak to him, he can never say I'm shit. I love exactly. That. It's genius. <laughs> Where are the medals now? They're all at my local amateur rugby club, uh, Southbridge. I got a little memorabilia um, sort of room all, all stashed there. So every time I go back and play in there, we've talked about, you know, when I started playing six-year-old for Southbridge, my local little amateur club with 700 people. I didn't realise at the time, but last year I played a few games for them. Yeah, we and, you saw, know, probably yeah. Gonna, it's probably going to be, you know, the last uh, last team that I played for. So I did a, a full circle there. It was um, yeah, quite a nostalgic moment, and that's obviously where all my memorabilia is locked, uh, alarmed, and you know, you know, got the whole community of seven hundred people like almost on rotation as security looking after that thing. But you know, it's a very it's a very sort of proud place, and obviously I've got a few sort of special pieces as well, um, you know, that I'll give to, to my children, to give to their children, and, and keep in the family for generations as well. Obviously, uh, local rugby clubs, I still play for mine every now and again. They always have some interesting initiations. Was yours, uh, <laughs> was yours slightly interesting? It was, it was feral. Yeah, it was, it was horrific. And, and one of the front rowers' garages, we had a, a good piss up back there after the game and they were just so excited. They were on another level. This is their chance to get me. So I had to leave the car at the, the club rooms and mum and dad were driving me. So my mum and dad were there for the initiation. <laughs> it's like embarrassing. But it was basically like a baseball diamond. Okay, and, and, you know. So each base you had different things to do. If you know, wheat bix with chilies. The worst one was two shots of bourbon, one up each nostril, followed by like a seven. Was like there was just throwing up everywhere. There's a couple of young boys that they made do it with me. You know, they'd already done the initiation, but they're like, <laughs> no, nah, I enjoyed it. So that helped a little bit, but it was absolutely feral, but man, I wouldn't want it any other way. It's, um, Did it's you... just part of that initiation that, uh, yeah, that you know all about, Tins. I was going to say, did you, was it, such a cause I always say that when I when I ended up playing I sort of uh, mentioned up to I sort of played 12 games that first year it was just so refreshing to go back to how you saw we you mentioned earlier the sort of amateur pro but go to go back to the full amateur and see that the fun and the the level of the social side of and, and what it is as a piece for a club is still going on was that did you find was that quite a nice refreshing change after what oh, you'd lived man. in for 18 years to go back and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. They're just playing for the, you know, the right reason. I'm not saying the professional, you know, that's the wrong reason, but these guys don't have aspirations to play for Canterbury, the Crusaders or All Blacks. You know, they're farmers, they work, but they're playing for that, just that sort of team sort of unity. You know, they're playing for that beer afterwards, that camaraderie of like, 
having a bit of fun with your mates and then, you know, you do the work, you're going to enjoy your beer afterwards because, you know, we've gone into to a wee battle together and, and the fact that a real sense of community as well. So the whole community comes down to watch the game. They're all at the club rooms. The, um, just people playing for, for what I believe sort of the right reasons um, at an amateur level. I, I absolutely loved it. It was just so refreshing uh, to be able to, to go back there and do that. And just the banter, you know, like country farm boys. I, I walk in with my nice sort of leather Louis Vuitton backpack and they're like, oh, gee, look, he's got his missus bag on and all this stuff. <laughs> you know, just riffing me out about my shoes and um, they just brought me right back down to earth. It was um, yeah, probably just what I needed. I can't I believe look- you went there with the Louis Vuitton bag. It's like oh, going was, back, so, going back no to branding. back to my no roots, guys. Oh, back to the roots. This is I'm oh, the same, no, no. I'm like the same black, lad. A black leather bag, <laughs> with no branding or logos on it. Like a black backpack. Like who, no one actually knew it was Louis Vuitton, but they just thought it was a good chance to, to rip me out. So. Mate. I can definitely next time you're over here, I definitely get a game from Bench, and I'm quite happy to play for Southies. I probably won't get in the team, but uh, probably, <laughs> the farmers will probably be better than me. But I'll definitely have a run around. Oh, mate, I'd love to, love to. Um, <laughs> like I said, I retired from professional rugby. There's, there's still a chance for a few games left. Still available for a good initiation. You mentioned the Louis Vuitton. I mean, it's a long way from Southbridge to the front row of Paris Fashion Week, etc. I mean, what, what is the what is the journey from one to the other? Have you always been quite yes, into threads? Yeah, I mean, sorry, sorry to throw that in, but I heard Has talking about um, Beats and Serato. Oh uh, yeah, so he'll he drop, he'll drop every brand around. he's ever worked I'm with. Gonna, I'm going to get in there for a wee plug. For, um, <laughs> well, you, wait, you know, I love Louis Vuitton because I've tried to hit you up for a contact like fifty times. <laughs> That's a Norse. Oh my. God, I was like, mate, go away. Like, seriously. Oh, yeah, I know. Like, delete it. <laughs> <laughs> I kept He's getting so this. New, new number, who dis? It's like, ah, <laughs> it's half. Sorry, I don't remember who that is. Oh. Sorry, mate. Yeah, they don't do discounts, I think was my answer. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, don't do discounts. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, honestly, that, that's mind-blowing um, to even just think you could potentially be sponsored by a world-class you know, uh, company and, and brand like that. I still remember my first end-of-year tour I was 21 and we went to, to Rome, to Paris, and I just saw this, you know, luxury fashion. And I was, I was blown away. So I was walking down the Champs-Élysées. I was like, mate, I'm going to build up the courage to go inside this Louis Vuitton store. Typical 21-year-old Kiwi, freezing cold. I was in my jandals, thongs, uh, whatever <laughs> you want to call it on your feet. I w- walked in there and the security guard kind of looks me up and down. He goes, man, he's going to steal something. He, he, he's not supposed to be in, in the shop. So he followed me all around the, the store and I was kind of looking at him going, mate, what's he up to? So I was like, right, bugger this, I'm going to buy something. <laughs> um, so I started trying stuff on, uh, the, started drinking champagne, pretending that, uh, you know, that, you know, I deserve <laughs> to be there. Uh, basically, I, I bought this, uh, this jacket, walked out, pretty much gave the middle finger to the security guard, walked back to the hotel going, what the f- <laughs> like, seriously, you just paid fifteen hundred bucks for a jacket, mate. You're, you're still on, you know, nothing at, at this stage. Um, you know, it's my sort of second year of playing professionally. I was like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so you go back there, and then you know, fast forward a few years, um, we are sort of sitting at, you know, a Louis Vuitton fashion show, or um, doing some of the amazing things that I've been able to. You know, to, to do with them, it's just such a contrast from from where I started, that little country country boy. And I'm forever grateful that to have those kind of opportunities. I'm grateful because they don't happen unless I wasn't able to be successful on the on the footy field. And that all comes off the back of dedicating pretty much most of my life into rugby. Like I haven't just stumbled on it. And you know, I see a lot of young guys that come in and they're trying to asking like oh, how do I get you know sponsors and I'm like simple you like be <laughs> you mean me <laughs> is that is yeah. me? I can't no I don't work with me because I was shit yeah. <laughs> don't, don't burst the bubble mate oh mate no honestly honestly some of the, ex- the opportunities that I've been um, involved with are purely off the back of um, what I've been able to achieve on the rugby field and and I've made a real effort of making sure that um, that sponsorship work and you know that balance in my life it doesn't it doesn't step in the the lane of rugby wanting to be the one of the best rugby players. So if I had to do some sponsorship work that was, you know, going into my time recovery or um, preparation for a game, then it was easy to say no to. 
And that was, I had to always just make sure that my main focus, my number one focus was always rugby. And if that it was, then, you know, the other things will, will feed off that. So I guess I got to enjoy it a little bit more in, in France when, you know, you're in Europe and there are a few more, few more events like that. But I'd so even then at the same time, like nothing was getting in, in the way of my number one priority, which was, which was rugby. I've still got a great skit in my head where you, you get the first one. It's like Julia Roberts in Pretty Woman. So he goes in first time and basically is a hooker, but then he comes back in the next time and the guy's, it's, te- it's five years down the line, he's the best room player in the world. The security guards go, oh, Mr. Carter, welcome in. And you're like, remember the first time I came in? Big mistake. Huge. You're fired. Get out. <laughs> Um, it takes a certain type of character to be able to wear his wife fronts on a hundred foot billboard as well. I mean, is that it is that in there at sort of top of the CV? And that was funny. <laughs> I was actually thinking earlier today, the first time I ever interviewed you, you were in a pair of jockeys. And it was the most extraordinary. It was sort of one of those you know, steady, steady on at least where you go. Oh, well, no, 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 but it gets, it gets I remember worse. doing yeah. interviews in my underwear. It gets Ask, worse. Ask cameras to start moving. <laughs> yeah, no. But it was one of those ones where Ask, everyone's we in a real to see panic. Your hands, hands at all times, please. Thank you. <laughs> but it's one of those ones where everyone's in a real panic before you arrive. And then in you came with, with your jockeys or whatever it was. And there was a very enthusiastic PR person who handed me a card. And on the back, it said in really bold letters, I'm gay. And I thought, this is turning into the most extraordinary thing I've ever done in my entire life. Very curious, sitting with the world's best player and his wife runs. And it wasn't until I got on the tube to go home that I looked at the card again. It said, I'm Gary on the back of it. So we could all kind of relax a little bit. And I sort of looked at you slightly differently. But I I just sort of wonder, you know, jockey now, you've got to be able to back that up if you do it. I mean, have you always had a bit of a strut in that regard? Oh, my, that's, yeah. Once again, it's quite the contrast. And I'll tell you how I stumbled across that. I think it was 2004, so I've been playing for a couple of years. And then I got approached, say, look, Jockey, this underwear company, they want to do three, three billboards with, with you on it. And I was like, no way, I couldn't think of anything worse. That's so embarrassing. And so I went back to the manager, I was like, no, sorry, I don't want to do it. And then I was sitting on the airplane that night, sitting next to Steve Hansen. I was like, mate, guess what, mate, this Jockey underwear company, they want me to be on three billboards. And he's like, well, what are they asking? And I told them. He goes, well, do you want to do it? I was like, no way. He goes, well, why don't you go back and ask five times uh, what they're what they're asking, you know, price wise? And you know, if they say no, we don't want to do it anyway. Uh, if they say yes, then shit, you're doing all right. So I took his advice and I, I did, and they got really upset. T- and you went ten times. No, <laughs> I'm actually giving that a go. But I just thought, you know, they came back as like, who does he think he, uh, you know, to ask this much? Uh, Twenty four hours later, they said yes, and I was like, oh no, now I have to actually do it. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's how I kind of stumbled across it. There was a whole lot of sort of sort of press around it and almost, I don't know, for the first time, you know, kind of got me in the spotlight of, okay, maybe he's sort of, you know, he's he's got a bit of a brand. And even I wasn't thinking of stuff like that at the time, but it kind of put me out in the spotlight a, a little bit more than, than I, I would have liked. Um, but I just kind of rolled with it as long as I was playing good footy. You know, that was taking care of all the, the criticism and, and everything that was coming with it. And it wasn't until I saw it. It hadn't been released yet, the billboards. And Justin Marshall somehow found it online. And he bloody put it, he blew it up and put it on the team room. And I remember walking into the team room and I was just so embarrassed. The boys are ripping me out. And, you know, big, big all black culture. No one's bigger than the team. You don't do yeah. shit like this, you know. Like, I was so embarrassed. I just was really upset. I stormed back to my um, bedroom and, and I just kind of salt counting my money (laughs) yeah what have you done um it was obviously ended up having a partnership with them for a good decade and you know they're one of the all black sponsors now so it was yeah as challenging as it was at the time uh, initially it it, it turned into a you know pretty cool partnership i mean has can has can introduce you into cameo so you can be doing your your, your (laughs) personal messages and everything you know he can hook he'll hook you up right up no, I feel like I knew, I knew the management, management group for uh, all these opportunities that, that Hess has gone, you know, up his sleeve. When well, you're talking Louis Vuitton, can we have a quick sort of, it's it's not quite phone book bingo, but uh, looking through Getty, pictures of you with Bex, Lewis Hamilton, Federer. Do they know their rugby, any of them? Bex, yeah, he obviously knows his, his footy. So I spent a little bit of time with him when I was over. He's playing for um, AC Milan and I kind of ran into him a couple of times. Who were the other? Lewis Hamilton? Hamilton? Don't know. No, we, we kind of had mutual friends, actually. 
So a lot of, yeah, we had, we had mutual friends, which was sort of opened up that conversation that was very brief at a Louis Vuitton uh, fashion show. Uh, the interesting one was Brady, Tom Brady. We um, spent a bit of time together and just sort of admiring the way and the legacy that he's leaving at the moment. We are at the Formula One in Monaco uh, doing some work with Tag Hui and he had his team around him and we're on the um, sort of the boat together and him and his team knew that I'd been to the Patriots and had a look yes. around their facilities and, and things like that. It was, it sort of blew me away. You know, being a humble little kid, I, I wasn't going to start the conversation. You know, I'm just going to sit there and, and they started talking, oh, you're the rugby player. We know that you've come to the Patriots and had a look around and we started talking about sort of trying to inspire the next generation. He, you know, he is all about inspiring, you know, the, these guys coming through college, the, the future of the NFL and I'm exactly the same like I get real satisfaction out of trying to inspire the next generation of rugby players so we had a good conversation about that which completely sort of blew me blew me away there aren't, many people, there aren't many people we have on this podcast who just seamlessly drops in Tom Brady and the <laughs> synergy between the two oh wait, sorry would you mean goats, about goats talk about goats though don't they Monaco, Tag Heuer, Lewis Hamilton, then Tom Brady. There was more drops in that. It was more clang, than another one. Clang. Because on, on that same boat, and um, it'd been a big day, and I was like, no, I just need a beer. So I went and got myself a beer. She didn't want me drinking by myself, so Bella had did. She grabbed a beer. She goes, hey, Dan, I can't have you drinking by yourself. So she grabbed a beer as well. So it was, um, yeah, was one of those moments. Shut like, up. Um, Get, get off this just seeing himself yeah. and raising himself it's just like you know you're the only person in the auction but you're still bidding yourself up it's very <laughs> impressive I've got, I've got going. a question did you did you almost sign for the, the Patriots was there actual serious talk about you going to play NFL oh no um, not really basically I got invited to have a look at the facilities um, which I was pretty excited about they'd obviously done their groundwork and realised that, that I could kick a you know an oval ball so when I arrived there, the head of scouting just goes, right, we're going out to the pitch. We're going to see if you can kick. And I was like, oh, oh I just thought I was having a look around. And I just injured my Achilles uh, tendon. So I was like, look, I can't. I'd love to, but I can't. And he goes, okay, no worries. Um, Mr. Robert Kraft, he, he wants to speak to you. I was like, oh, cool. You know, the owner of the Patriots. He's going to welcome me to the facilities. That's really nice of him. I walked in there. How long do you want to play in the NFL? what are you going to bring to the team and all the stuff? And I was like, whoa, whoa, just sort of bullshit my way through it. Oh, you're my childhood dream. You know, I think, you know, coming from a, a different sport, I could really help in this way. And then he goes, okay, cool. Because the, the head of um, special teams wants to meet you. So I went to the head of special teams and we went through all the kickers in the league. And he's like, you know, the importance of your plant foot. And I love that because obviously I, I'm a kicker and I love breaking – you know, the, the kicking sort of technique down. So we did that for two hours. And then he went to the head of scouting, the guy that I met outside the facilities. And he sat down and goes, hey, look, you know, explain the whole college system, how they normally recruit players. But Robert Kraft, he thinks outside the box a little bit. So, you know, this could be a great story. And I'm sitting there going, what's going on here? Like, seriously, <laughs> I, I thought I was just coming for a look at the facilities. This is crazy. You know, after that meeting, I ended up getting a look around the facilities and incredible, like compared to our humble little <laughs> sort of Crusaders facilities where they've just got pitches, staff, everything. It was on another level. And at the end of the, the day, they gave me a ball and said, look, in the next six months, we want you to send some, some footage. We want to see if you're able to kick this ball or not. And if you can, then, you know, you can come to tryouts. So this is, I think it's around December 2013. So I'm sitting here going, okay, yeah, right, I've got a World Cup that I'm pretty keen on uh, in a couple of years. You know, is it something I do post-2015? So I flirted with the idea a little bit, tried kicking the ball, realised how tough it was. But also at that stage, you know, I had a family to think about, to move them all to, to go just to a tryout, eventually kick like shit, get the red card, send back to New Zealand. It was just, you know, so I just flirted with the idea, ended up signing a, a contract in France and sticking to, to what I know. But at the same time, it was, yeah, it was definitely something that, yeah, I flirted with a little bit, but never took it too seriously. Did you, kick it? Did you ever get any good at kicking it or not? No, nah, not really. I'd, I'd never really put too much time into it. Just at the end of a kicking session, I'd, I'd pull it out. And I still do to this day, just sort of, you know, kick it and, you know, for them, it's, it's, I would have had to completely change my technique, um, which yeah. I wasn't keen on doing. You need a, a lot shorter run-up, and I had a really long run-up. 
Um, the fact that I'm so used to kicking a ball where the ball was already on a tee. So to be at the back of my run-up and there's no ball or anything was really hard. So you're almost running and just about to kick it, there's no ball, then all of a sudden, just as your leg swings, you know, a ball appears. And so just, it, w- it would have taken a lot of time, a real commitment. But I, I always yeah. thought Wilco would have headed there because he, he, it was part of his routine. He, he kicked like 30 spirals, 30 drop punts with, because they're so, they are way smaller, aren't they? There's such a small sweet spot on them. So he always thought it would then translate across to his, to uh, to a rugby ball. I don't know whether he did much place kicking with it, but he did so much. Yeah, I would have thought it. he was been amazing. Uh, you know, he had a nice short run up. He had a real sort of few couple of years with shoulder injuries, so they would have healed because you know, yeah, the beauty of a kicker. You're not making any tackles or doing anything. You're just kicking. So mate, but you know, he obviously got over that and yeah. finished his career on such a high over in France. So. He did pretty well. We still hold. We still hold for Gavin Hastings. He's the only one. Scottish Claymores. The new keeper, Gavin Hastings. Few Aussie rules. Few Aussie rules. Uh, punters go over there now, which is it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. I'm actually really worried that you know I know a lot of your listeners don't actually care about rugby, and we've been quite serious <laughs> this whole time. And no, no, no. Honestly, well, half of them have like switched off. Switched no. off by now. We had when we had spoke to Kieran Reed the other day. We asked the question. You know, would you greet him with a hug or a handshake? And he said. He'd greet Richie with a handshake and you with a hug. Would you greet Richie with a hug, a handshake, or a goose tap? <laughs> um, yeah, I'd probably know that I should go in for a handshake, but I'll go for a hug just to try and make it as awkward as possible, just to kind of break the ice. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but no, just yeah, definitely a firm handshake, you know. But he's such a, a special individual person, a mindset that I've never seen before, even just. To, what he's doing now he's finished playing like this uh, endurance racing and doing six day races and just putting his body through hell. He's just, he's a different breed, uh, a very sort of special sort of unique person. You know, we've had an amazing relationship throughout our career. You know, we were best mates early in our career. And then, you know, he got the captaincy, got the learnings of 2007 and then he went into that mentality of like, mate, this is where I'm going. No one's going to get in the way of me achieving what I want this team to achieve. And it was so inspiring. I was like, okay, we'll put our friendship on hold a little bit um, and and I'll come with you. Uh, that's the, the mentality that it, that he had. And I, it's a little bit of an exaggeration because we, we're still mates. But yeah, I guess he had a sort of real focus of where he wanted to go to and probably a big part of the reason you know, he didn't get you know married and, and children until you know, till after after his, his career so um, a huge amount of respect for him feel completely honored and, and privileged to have played my career with him and not against him because if I played against him I'd yeah I would have been trying to kill him um, all the cheating that he was doing and um, you know how much he's paying the referees and, and all that stuff heard and it from the I'm horses oh my god I we warned, got why did he run up clip it I, there oh, is the clip right. no it doesn't matter no, you can't take it back yeah. we can thanks edit for, it to however we want uh, thanks for coming right right back yeah, yeah, cheers, later. cheers see you later hey Richie right, <laughs> burn turn ball <laughs> I want to see the final edit of this, please. <laughs> yeah, I need a Sorry, mate. We like we like to every guest telling them we'll edit it out. We won't. We just keep it in anyway. And then we just delete your number. It's <laughs> anyway, it's good knowing you guys. Um, <laughs> bankers, and I'll probably get to <laughs> yeah, it. Do you look forward, though, in all seriousness? I mean, do you think there'll come a time, no time soon, where the two of you in your old rocking chairs on the, um, you know, on the porch will crack a beer and say... We went, you know, we, we've sort of done that in that sort of, we did our own way at times, but there are a lot of similarities. No, we, um, we still do, to be honest. Um, not that often or as much as we would have both like, um, because, you know, you know, families and he's in Christchurch, I'm up in Auckland, I've been in Japan, France, things like that. But there were some pretty special times throughout the 2019 World Cup when we we're both uh, in Tokyo uh, together and we'd just be in the hotel room over a beer, just talking about some of the things we'd achieved, but also just solving the world's problems and what the problems with the All Blacks and just just sharing, you know, sort of knowledge and experience and thoughts with somewhat like a like-minded person is, um, is awesome. And we've done it over the phone a couple of times recently as well. It's, yeah, it's a yeah, pretty special and, and unique bond. 
Which just, one of you's bound to pay for the beers? Is he is he tight or are you? Are you who's the generous one out of two? Oh mate, he, he's he definitely never play. spent fifteen hundred on a Louis Vuitton coat. I tell you <laughs> so, that. No, he's, he's not that silly. So he, he'll hate me saying it, but you know I'm I'm probably the one buying the beers. <laughs> just on that, you you're saying you talked about yeah, what's wrong. Well, not what's wrong, but what's next for the the New Zealand team at the moment. Obviously, there's a bit of for. Kiwis, there is a bit of criticism around. Obviously, 2019, change of coach, you know, lot, a couple of losses since then. Do you think they're at that point that you were at where maybe they need to either back a coach or they need to set their own uh, environment and come in and have those early talks that you, you have? And then do you get involved by suggesting that or not? Yeah, I mean, we're often sort of working towards and, and judged around, you know, World Cup results. And so, you know, 2019 wasn't, uh, you know, the most successful World Cup for them. <clears throat> but as much as I wanted the, the team to win, I think that could be a little blessing in disguise uh, because the players that were at that 2019 World Cup, you know, the Kieran Reeds, the Sam Whitelocks, you know, the experienced leadership group, they'd only been a part of 2011, 2015. They'd only been part of success. They didn't have that underlying hurt of knowing what it takes to to lose a world uh, a world cup which is something that that we had um you know a few of the players had um in 2011 and 2015 there were players in that squad that were there in 2007 and and i don't think you can underestimate the the power of knowing what it's like to to lose a, a world cup so all of a sudden You've got a young group in 2019 that have experienced that, and that's going to underlie some real motivation for the future at, uh, at the next World Cup, which for me is exciting. Now they just got to get the, the structures right, you know, commit to a coach, commit to making some some bold selections, um, you know, getting the kind of, you know, the I, I don't know enough because I'm not involved in, in the environment, but just getting some really key sort of value set in place um, because I know that I've got some hurt from what happened in 2019 and, and you know, that that's, for me, that's exciting. Do you watch much rugby now or have you kind of parked it? Oh, I'd love to watch more, to be honest, but with three kids and a fourth on the way to Tawana, you know, this is me for the next hour and a half. Uh, it's, it's quite hard to do. So even when I played in France, I learned how special and amazing the, the Six Nations is and I loved it. Um, time zones are just killing me here. I often get the kids up early in the morning. I can, you know, get the last 20 minutes or, or something of a game, you know, w- which I did uh, in the weekend. And I noticed you guys haven't talked much about uh, the, the result on the weekend. Um, <laughs> understandably so. But, um, you know, I guess I, I don't get to watch. Uh, <laughs> shit, the boys are all going silent and quiet. You're, you're much faster in the way you control. Yeah. You oh, are trolling. I noticed that Matt Gitto sticks up a picture of him in a Wales jersey. I just like your subtlety in the way that you knife. So, um, yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. I'm just going to get. Uh, do you remember this picture? You, this was just you're looking happy. Oh, good tins, good yeah. comeback. Yeah, there you go. Just remind you of that picture. That that's you when we were just. Uh, I think it was 60 minutes into that England game, oh, and I was like, mate, you still could have a chance. Oh, mate, I know. But yes, I know. Yes, I do remember that photo. And <laughs> keeping that still doesn't top, um, you know, top top what I was talking about and the result of the weekend. <laughs> no, no. Do, you know what? Do, do you know what the most embarrassed I've ever been of my dad? And there's a lot of things to be embarrassed about my old man. But Dan, I don't know if you remember it, but I was basically, when the game when we beat you at Twickenham, right, when you, came, when you played that game, Basically, yeah. my dad, after game, we were in the spirit of rugby, and I introduced him to Adam Thompson. I was like, this is Adam Thompson. I spent time with the high and said, this is my, you know, this is Dan Carter, you know. And my dad, like, doesn't normally get shy, but he obviously, like, panicked and thought, <laughs> he just reached into darkness and went, oh, well, I suppose they're confiscating all shoelaces and belts, aren't they, after that performance, Dan? And I was like, Are you? And I literally, you, you, like, you were really polite and smiled and were like, Obviously looked at it and thought, fucking hell, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. Son's an <laughs> arsehole. Dad's an arsehole. And I'm like smiled and walked oh. off. I turned to my dad. I was like, dad, you just fucking told Dan Carter. It's the first game they've lost in ages. 
whether he's going to hang himself or whether everyone's on suicide watch. What were you thinking? And he goes, oh, son, you know me. I'm always adding value. I was like, dad, I'm adding value. I remember I think I text you. I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about my dad. Like, but, you know, I don't think he just panicked. It's so bad. I know. No, a few people would take that the wrong way. I thought it was, uh, it was a good bit of banter. <laughs> Quick five questions. Best player you ever played with? Uh, Richie McCall. Best player you played against? Jonah Lomo. Best European player you ever played against when you were wrestling with Perpignan? Thierry Dusatois. Good answer. Play you feared? Oh, geez, any one of the South African uh, Ford pack. Um, they used to, I used to have a little target right here. And uh, yeah, <laughs> got actually dealt to on numerous occasions. Not uh, the moneymaker. Not the moneymaker. <laughs> <laughs> Haskell or Tyndall? Oh, geez, I can't do that. Paino. Oh, uh, man, you can come again. Best try you ever scored? All Black debut. Best kick you ever made? My last one with my right foot. Oh. And, uh, yeah. How long have you been wanting to do that? Obviously, I, I grew up um, kicking off both feet. My old man got to kick off both feet. Just hounded me pretty much my whole life about it. And so I wasn't wanting to do it. I hadn't really thought about it before, but it, early on at the World Cup, we we're just having dinner and Aaron Smith goes, you ever kicked a conversion with your wrong foot? And I was like, no, but that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? And then Liam Messon was like, do it. And I was like, okay, well, if we're up by more than seven in the World Cup final, um, I'll do it. Uh, so the three of us talking about it and uh, Liam Messon was running my kicking tee on that day. He's like, remember our conversation? And he was like, yeah, I'm doing it with my right foot. And he goes, no, nah, don't, don't, because he's stressing out. <laughs> I quickly put it on and quickly, quickly did it. And that's just how it all came about. But it you know, almost goes back to, to, to my old man who was just handing me for years and years to be able to kick off both feet. So it was, yeah, it was quite a cool moment to be able to do. I don't want to come across as cocky and kind of sticking it up. Quick, I did it so quickly, but did I, I failed to think that, okay, you got thousands of photographers as it's been recorded. You're not going to get away with it. You know, so. it's, it's a good cherry on top. The banana kick, the banana kick, intentional, obviously. It was, yeah. The wind was just howling towards me. I was like, if I kick it, the wind's just going to get it and it's going to probably end up behind me. So I was like, okay, I practice these at training all the time. It's a bit of fun at the end of training. Put it like on an angle like this. If you kick it, it'll bend. Not many people know that I actually miss hit it. I kind of shanked it, which makes it even go even more. Um, so I wasn't expecting it. I was expecting it to do a banana, but not a banana as bent as that. Yeah, obviously a good one for the highlights reel. Yeah, yeah it's good on the C, on the CV, that one. Thing you'll miss most about the game? Oh, the, the team camaraderie, the, the banter and the changing room. I um, just can't, can't replace it. To an extent where I had 10 months off my neck injury and I went back to Kobe Steelers and it just started straight away. He runs ripping into each other. And I was just, I had some time off. I was thinking, man, this is workplace bullying on so many levels um, and so many <laughs> other companies. And, you know, just at a rugby environment, it's, it's something sort of unique and, and special and probably you can only get away in, in an environment like that. And it's, it's a big thing that I, that I miss. I uh, miss from rugby now is, is just that sort of camaraderie and, and banter with the boys. Thing you won't miss. Jeez, I'm tossing up between sort of ice baths, which I, I hated throughout my whole career. I had you had an ice bath with that jockey photo? <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered because I had a massive sort of pad in front. So even whether Did I was you? drunk yeah, or not, that, was, that, was, that was part of the cash he paid him. You stuck it down there, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. I would have said that five times and a huge sock down the front. Please. So like, <laughs> no ice baths um, post rugby, no, no ice baths pre jockey shoots. Yeah, Best moment no. in rugby that nobody knows about. I was going to know, everyone knows about my, my initiation now. Not many people knew about that. DC, did you get to play for, did you do Barbarians? No. So there you go, there's the best team that you never got to play for. Yeah, so the plan was last year before COVID, you know, finish the Japanese season. Uh, That was probably going to be it, but I've always wanted to play Barbars. So Barbars were playing England at Twickenham in June uh, last year. You know, played my 100th test match there. I actually played my last All Black game there. Uh, Robbie Deans is a Barbar's coach, so he was trying to get me there. My first ever professional coach, I was like, against England, you know, so many nostalgic moments. I would have just loved it. Absolutely loved to, for that to be my last game. Unfortunately, with everything that has happened with the, the pandemic, it wasn't uh, meant to be, and, and rightly so, um, because what's going on is sort of bigger than sport. But there was still a part of me that was gutted, sort of devastated. And I was in a, I was in a pretty dark place back home when they cancelled the Japanese season, learnt the Barbas weren't going to play in June. And I still remember walking into my, my son's bedroom 
And he was like, what's wrong, Dad? I'm like, oh, man. And I was just thinking purely all about myself, going, oh, they just cancelled this, I've cancelled that. And he could tell I was a bit annoyed. And he goes, does that mean you're not going away anymore? And I was like, yeah. And he gave me a big hug. And I was like, oh, okay, gee, okay, right. Put everything into perspective. So then I was like, oh, well, if I can play here, maybe I should, you know, see if I have the drive to play in New Zealand anymore. And because I was annoyed about the cancellation of these games, Leon McDonald was like, do you want to come for the Blues? I was like, not really, but there's a part of me that just wants to see if I have that drive to play in New Zealand anymore. Um, I went there, and after the first day, it was so weird putting on the Blues kit. I was like, man, I'm a crusader. This is so strange. Um, once I got out on the field, I was like, cool, I'm playing rugby. This is, this is what I love doing. I remember driving away going, man, if I'm going to be here, I want to be running this team, committed to it. I'm going to be the starting number 10, all this stuff. There's Bodie there and stuff. But in my mind, I knew what that took, what kind of dedication. Because if I do something, I'm all in. But at the same time, I didn't have that drive because I didn't want to be at the, the gym at three o'clock in the afternoon doing weights. I want to be picking my kids up from school. You know, that's where my priorities started changing. And I was like, well, okay, well, if you, you know, and that's what I was trying to figure out all last year. I was like, okay, well, I don't have the drive. I don't want to play overseas. I, I just learned that I don't want to have anything to prove here in New Zealand anymore. You know, so that's what I was kind of just thinking about all the end of last year and, and understanding what a, what a perfect time to, to not go chasing another contract with, you know, the family, the kids, the ages that they are with the number four on the way, just the timing, time was perfect. It actually took my second son, uh, Fox, to kind of put everything into perspective because I thought providing for my family was, you know, signing a great contract, playing for as long as possible. Um, but actually I realised that, no, that, that doesn't matter as much as, as sort of being there for them. So it was a bit of a wake, wake up call. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really sort of yeah, glad that, that I was able to get that. Got a lot to prove to anybody. It's so nice to hear of a, a guy who's been there and done it and, and got it all, who is, you know, loving life for what it is right now, which is, which is brilliant and full testament to you. You got fourth on the way. So, I mean, that's obviously the headline. What else is keeping you busy now, you know, where are you venting your competitive juices? How are you taking out your frustrations? <laughs> yes. Um, the beauty is that, like I've said, I've kind of been clocked off for a while now. So I'm understanding the things in rugby that, are, that I'm missing and, and just trying to work out ways to, to help deal with those. You know, it's quite scary. And through this process, I've really enjoyed talking to, to ex-players and realising the things that they miss and the, the difficulties with this next chapter. So the best, biggest thing that I've learned is, is not to jump into something straight away because six months, 12 months down the track, you know, you, you'll regret it and you're doing it because of the fear of not knowing what's next. So just taking a bit of time out, sort of repurposing. Um, I'm involved in a, a lot of projects um, where I'm, that, that I'm really passionate and, and care about and, and just, you know, using... You know, my learnings, my knowledge, even, you know, my theories and the art of winning to, to help with, you know, help with those projects. So understanding that I want flexibility in my life as well to be around family over the next few years. So um, I thought that's a, you know, a good way to get involved in these projects to be able to, to give me that flexibility. We've absolutely loved having you on. You can tell it's been a good show because Hask has basically just sat quietly with the look of love in his eyes. I mean, how, how big is he's, the man crush his, off the back of that? With his hands down the pan, his pants. <laughs> yeah, obviously... For me, I'm always interested in, in the personalities of, of, of people as well as their, their ability. And I think, um, you know, Dan, for me, embodies everything that's great about rugby and sports people, you know, to be as to the top of his game, but to also be a good lad off it, to always want to be in the pursuit of excellence, to always talk to anyone, to give anyone the time of day, to to appreciate and have the confidence and his ability, but also not to, to get carried away by it. I think it's inspirational. And there's so much stuff I, I learned today. And I, and I sort of, you, you assume it because of, the way players tick, but just the attention to detail, writing everything down, even on a, you know, days off and planning, but also going out and enjoying himself and doing it with a smile and always being a good guy. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's always a credit because uh, the media can hype someone up and the fans can hype someone up, but nothing tells you more about a person than when they retire, what their teammates say. And everybody's just come out and said the most glowing things about him. So uh, he's a hero and he's an absolute dreamboat. And Tins, 03, I mean, you know, the beat of the butterfly's wing and that win... Um, in Windy Wellington sort of turned into quite a tornado you and your mob you've set a man on I'm not sure you can take a lot of credit but it, it must have been good to be there at the start better than yeah. the end certainly oh yeah I'm definitely not taking any credit for, for that one um, I think 
like has just said things that jump out balance uh, for any kid who's listening to this to this podcast or any parent of a of a child who th- thinks they can make it you know the signs of balance and the constant message that just ta- talent isn't enough um you have to work hard and it, and it's great to sort of hear so, what someone who's classed as the or one of the greats of the game it wasn't done just on natural talent it still takes hard work it still takes commitment and and if you're not going to go all in you ain't going to get the rewards and you know it was always a pleasure to play against him never got to play with him which was would, would have been nice especially at bar bars because i know we'd have had a good night out after but uh um, it's always been. It's always great to catch up. We had such a good time catch, whenever we do catch up in 2019 and everything with the World Cup. So, no, I salute you and uh, I wish you all the best for the future. Cheers, fellas. Um, not going to be able to walk out of this door with such a big head uh, <laughs> after those those remarks. But that's, that's the beauty of sport. Like, yes, you know, we played against each other. We all put so much uh, of our life into rugby and and now we can kind of walk away and, and we're all mates, which is, is something that, that I love about the sport. So man, I'm looking forward to these borders opening up and getting over there and, and enjoying a pint with these. Hopefully we're all going to come down for the Women's World Cup in, in, if we're allowed in uh, this autumn. That'd be quite nice. Yeah. Barbecue at Carters. Dan, thank you. Do you know, I, it's funny you mentioned the England game. It's been a fairly average week to be an England supporter on a number of different levels, not just the rugby actually, but everything that's gone around it. It's been really nice to have two hours with a goat just talking about what makes rugby rugby. So thank you so much for your time. Look after yourself and honour and good luck with number four when it comes. Um, and we'll look forward to a bit of you, you ain't seeing him for shit when number four comes. <laughs> that's oh, very that's true. Now, he, now he's at home all the time. He used to run to training know. to hide. I was going to say, there might be a few more podcasts we need to do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, i tell you what, there might be a few more contracts if you can't tie a knot in it. You've got four, <laughs> you're playing until you're 45, mate. They're not, you have a 17 yeah, yeah, by mate. the end of it. Get some hobbies cheap, but not that. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, we will say, um, that is it. <laughs> the good, the bad and the rugby this week with huge thanks to the legend that is Mr Dan Carter we are going to talk England next week after a big deep breath but until then be nice to each other uh, thank you again for listening and for watching don't forget to check out the website goodbadrugby.com for the Norse's stats it's also where you can get our GB and our merch we'll be back next week with another World Cup winning World Player of the Year would you believe it see you in seven days time thank you Dan Rob Bryden all yours <laughs>